finally gonna be making this video. I've been wanting to make it for over a year now. Basically, I'm just going to talk about feminist film theory and do my makeup at the same time because it's like ironic, you know? Prepping myself for the male gaze. I'll probably just stick to like the seminal, most important or most famous because who's to say what's the most important, but the most famous works to give like a basis, foundation in feminist film theory. So yeah. You might be wondering, who am I to be talking about this? And you know, I'm wondering the same thing. And this is not a tutorial because I'm not good at makeup just gotta get a roll with the makeup so I don't get confused. So in 1973, Laura Mulvey wrote the iconic Visual Pleasures and Narrative Cinema, which then was officially released in 1975. Her husband um, was invited to speak at some something. He was like a faculty member. He got invited to speak somewhere and she, they asked her out of like politeness, do you wanna write a piece for this convention? And she ends up writing what is to this day the most famous essay on feminist uh, film theory, feminine spectatorship, all of that. And when we talk about feminist film theory, the most important words to you know hone in on are spectatorship, um, spectatorship and gaze. All these have to do with looking, but the difference is the gaze often refers to the camera. So whoever's making the film, wherever the camera is pointed at, and then spectatorship is you in the theater watching the movie. Laura Mulvey basically was going in on, um, on mainstream Hollywood cinema and basically saying how it is made by and for men, and in that way, it objectifies women on the basis of sexual difference. Sexual difference is being the biggest um, difference between people, even though we know that's not really the case. Like, all of us are multifaceted beings. Mulvey brings in a lot of psychoanalytic, Freudian kind of analysis. Women represent this castrated individual that men are subconsciously afraid of. So then the only way to resume power is to be this active presence that objectifies her and uses her for pleasure or to release anger, whatever it may be. Laura Mulvey says how women are subjected to the male gaze. Hollywood industry cinema represents the male gaze. It's men who are supposedly writing the scripts behind the camera, directing, doing all of these jobs to produce the movies. We are beholding their desire and seeing things the way they want to see it, but never getting accurate um, representations of how women might feel being looked at or um, doing the looking. This passive female is associated with a to-be-looked-at-ness. I like that term. It's just like, you know, she is here to be looked at. You, that's, that's the woman's purpose. Often when a woman comes on screen, the dialogue, the narrative flow will pause so that we can, you know, look at her up and down, you know, just take in how she looks. And then a lot of the time, female characters won't be given any narrative agency. Nothing they do will really push the story forward. We won't know very much about them. They're just there to support main characters, uh, the main male character protagonist, you know, make him seem capable of love, make him seem desirable. And not only to women, but you know, other men want to be him type shit. In classes, a lot of the time, you'll get shown uh, that scene from Transformers when 
Megan Fox like opens the hood of the car. In my classes, we watched Rear Window like twice to talk about the male gaze. It was um, Buffalo 66 when Layla is like tap dancing in the bowling alley. Literally everything stops. We were just having like this super erotic um, <laughs> bowling montage and then she just starts tap dancing and like literally a spotlight comes down. She is like the focus of attention. You're just watching her dance and she's beautiful. Since Laura Mulvey wrote visual pleasures and narrative cinema, a lot of people have criticized the idea that, um, you know, only men can gaze um, and brought up the ideas of women who, you know, also have sexual desire for other women and just women as spectators in general. A lot of the, the film theory that followed Laura Mulvey's essay ended up being a response to her. In 1982, Marianne Doan wrote the essay, um, Film and the Masquerade, theorizing female spectatorship. She was talking about how women, how this, female gaze, she didn't coin that term, but how that starts to manifest um, alongside this Hollywood standard. And I think it's really important to mention that this idea of the male gaze is, it's inherently tied to mainstream, cin mainstream cinema. In, you know, more grassroots kind of productions, women are making films. It's just that the mainstream Hollywood cinema is based on a patriarchal structure. So there were very few female um, directors who were promoted as f mainstream filmmakers. At the time, maybe Dorothy Arzner is the best known who's making movies in the Hollywood industry. But other than that, women are still watching movies and um, making them even though it's not considered for them. First she questions the rigidity of visual pleasures because it's so intensely is like man, woman, you know, active, passive. These lines do not cross but it's like okay well can a woman ever be the bearer of a gaze and um, is it possible that a woman can share the same ideas as a man in a patriarchal society and you know Mm. She basically presents two ways for women to deal with patriarchal um, control of the cinema. And it's like either you um, identify with the man's point of view um, and, you know, look at, uh, start objectifying women as well, I guess, or <laughs> you take advantage of your femininity and you know you use it like a mask essentially that's what the feminine masquerade refers to which is actually a term um i think by joan riviere that's basically saying you know gender is a performance and so go on and perform in regards to spectatorship though i'm like okay maybe you are identifying with the femininity of characters so that you can actually enjoy um, a film experience without being like, ugh, the patriarchy, oh my God, this is not fun. Like you have to drop yourself into that performance in order to even have a good time watching a movie. I think that if there is a film that is not serving you and you know, you have to you have to like bend yourself around different ways to try and enjoy it. Just, you know, don't, don't enjoy it. You don't have to because there's so many other movies. And I guess at this time it was harder to find the kinds of movies that would, you know, be satisfactory, would subvert this patriarchal domination. The problem with a lot of feminine, feminist film theory, especially from this time, is that it is entirely focused on white women. You know, we 
they're talking about this monolithic woman, this monolithic man, which I don't care about the monolithic man right now, honestly, but you're talking about this one kind of woman that is portrayed in Hollywood cinema. Well, um, the woman they're talking about who gets stopped and stared at during, um, in the middle of action is a white woman. At the time, the only black women who were, you know, really being portrayed in cinema were like the mammy stereotype. Sometimes you get your tragic mulatto, um, and then we started in the 70s you start getting black exploitation films but you know all of these are very exploitative so there is this erasure of black women in not only the cinema but then when we start talking about women's problems um which brings me to the moment you all have been waiting for uh we're gonna talk about the oppositional gaze by bell hooks So a little background, the history of feminism is broken into different waves. Third wave feminism came about in the late 80s, early 90s. The second wave was very much like about Western white women, you know. But um, the third wave, we start seeing some intersectionality, intersectionalism. and. Basically, what that means is recognizing that there are multiple spheres of oppression. White women are oppressed because they are women, but black women suffer, and other women of other ethnic backgrounds, depending on what country they are, particularly in the West, are discriminated against also for race and ethnicity. Laura Mulvey's theory is reductive because it also, you know, doesn't, it doesn't address that there are other other reasons why a woman might um, not be able to identify with uh, with Hollywood cinema other than just sexual difference. Everything is not predicated on sexual difference as you know white feminism often portrays. So you know, Bell Hooks, she is, you know, writer, activist, in her essay, The Oppositional Gaze, uh, Bell Hooks, oh wait, hold on, let me, let me get, let me get organized really quick, because I am just talking and I have no idea what I'm doing. I bought an eyeliner for this because I will do some crazy eyeliner right now. She begins by talking about how the gaze is considered dangerous and there is a lot of power in looking especially if you're black in the past you know with slavery even to this day just looking at someone is considered um an act of violence against them slaves weren't allowed to look at white people you know getting in trouble for looking at white people if you want to talk about emmett till pfft, looking at white people and getting beaten or murdered for that we are often discouraged from you know looking cinema offers an experience of looking unabashedly however we are being subjected to um looking at reminders of our oppression she spoke to a lot of different black women um at the time when she was writing this essay and a lot of them said they couldn't they just didn't enjoy going to the movies. And, you know, even if you want to talk about black exploitation films, a lot of the time you have this hypersexualization of black women. Film thrives off of marginalized people. The spectacle. This is not working. She calls out Mantia Diawara, famous black film theorist. and. He has talked about how um, how the Hollywood cinema industry um, maintains the oppression and discrimination of black people. But again, we don't get a direct um, 
we don't get a direct link to the Black female experience. And so you take Manthea Diawara's ideas, you take Laura Mulvey's ideas, you take, you know, even let's say Marianne Doan. You start getting to a place where you can begin to understand Black female spectatorship. And Bell Hooks was just like, yo, Black women are violently erased from the cinema because they are either not shown or they are shown in inadequate forms. We continue to be ignored in um, in theory as well, in literature. She's like, why did I have such a hard time finding anything on Black female spectatorship when I was doing my research? That's fucked up. Basically, the representation of Black women in cinema is based on... Um, it's based on stereotypes. Stereotypes create a disconnect between what we're viewing and the reality. People who, you know, don't even know a black person are out here just believing what they see on TV or in the theater. The oppositional gaze, that term, actually refers to how black women should deal with these issues. I really bought a new eyeliner for this and ended up using my old eyeliner that's crazy yeah so a few ways to deal with this um put black women to you know assert their place as spectators is adopting a more critical uh, method for viewing cinema if you see some shit that is fucked up stereotypical shit racist shit in a movie you're like you say something about it, you talk to other people about your viewing experience, and then beyond that, you become the creator or the author of your own image. If Hollywood is not going to promote uh, realistic portrayals of Black women, then Black women ha have to do it. You know, you have to show up for yourself, as we always have to do. As time and time again, history shows us we gotta do. Um, so, yeah. I feel like this needs to be darker. Another essay I would like to shout out really quick. It's called, um, Performative Acts and Gender Constitution. I honestly feel like it should be required reading. A lot of the theoretical issues with the more famous works of feminist film theory is that they are still beholden to the dichotomy of gender, to the gender binary. And so um, a big part of being free of the problems of pa patriarchy is to realize that it is based on a fucked up system to begin with. Privilege of sex over all other, other aspects of a person, it's reductive to say the least. Um, breaking free of that that's the most important thing that's just on on life not even we don't even have to relate that to cinema another person i would like to shout out susan sontag i definitely want to talk about a susan sontag essay at some point but um for anyone who's interested in feminist film theory i just go um on those different websites that have a bunch of essays and read them um you know like jstor stuff that's connected to school i also by this film journal. It's this British film journal. It talks about feminism, talks about, you know, queer film theory, and which I honestly feel like are very much connected. I guess this is the makeup look? I don't know. No, it's not done. Curl the eyelashes. I feel like I didn't say enough, but I have to just make this video. I'm gonna go um, change my outfit really quick and I'll be right back. Final thoughts, um, the patriarchy is alive. Don't let it control how you experience film. Watch whatever the fuck you want. Final, final thoughts, you know, don't stay in school if you get it exploited and do drugs in moderation. 
and um, I love you.